we started Deuteronomy chapter 26 last week. I'm going to finish it this week and get well into chapter 27. Now, chapter 26 began a four-chapter section that marks the end of a kind of um, lengthy review and reminder uh, of the laws given on Mount Sinai, and it begins the part of Moses' sermon that deals more with um, mystical and spiritual aspects of what is expected of Israel in its relationship with Jehovah. Now, I say mystical and spiritual in a couple of senses. First is that the spirit of the law, what the Apostle James called true religion, is vital in carrying out the individual rules and regulations previously laid out. And second is that there are aspects of God's nature and His Word that are beyond mankind's ability to entirely comprehend. But at the same time, he has given to Israel straightforward instructions, laws and commandments, that are fully understandable to humans. The nature of the Word of God is that it consists of various levels of depth. The notion that God's Word spans a range from the most plain and straightforward to the, the deepest and the most mystical, has been captured in an interesting rabbinical principle of, of Scripture study. And that principle says that there are essentially four definable levels or dimensions of learning and biblical examination. Shot, remez, drash, and sod. Now, pshat means the most straightforward and intended meaning. Remez is what you read between the lines. Drash is an interpretive meaning that it can include the allegorical. Sod is the most mystical and esoteric. So to be clear, it's not that scripture is divided up such that some of it's presented as Peshat, and other scriptures, Remez, and so on. Rather, it is that all scripture passages can be examined on each of these four levels in general. It also generally is agreed that all scripture is not alike. Some scripture is inherently more straightforward. Some is inherently more mystical. Some is meant to be taken more at its face value, others is meant to be looked at far more deeply. Thus, what can be gained by examining the Word of God using each of these four levels will vary somewhat according to the relevant passage. So the four chapter section beginning with chapter 26 is dealing with passages that are more mystical. So they're more conducive to yielding their meaning to us when we study, study them using the sowed level of examination. Now, one of these instructions is that upon entering the promised land, a series of first fruits ceremonies are to begin, and that they're to be accompanied with declarations by each Israelite that his own personal identity is wrapped up in Israel's redemption history. Therefore, the declaration that each Israel states when they bring a first fruits offering is that this set apart people was created by an act of God and that their founder, Abraham, was a wanderer from Aram, today known as Syria. And eventually, through Abraham, this led to Jacob, with but a few people that formed his clan, who then went down into Egypt where his family became enslaved. And yet, in the midst of all that, it grew enormously. And that after that, God rescued them, he redeemed them, and then he brought them to the land of Canaan, which he gave to the Israelites as their land, inheritance, and possession. 
And as a result of this reality, then Israel is to give back to the Lord, out of gratitude, the first of each new harvest, and they are to share their bounty with widows and orphans and foreigners living in their land. Let's begin today by rereading a portion of Deuteronomy chapter 26. We're going to start at verse 12 and go to the end. So that means we're going to go to page 225 if you have a complete Jewish Bible. 225 and Deuteronomy 26 chapter 12, uh, rather uh, 26 uh, verse 12. After you have separated a tenth of the crops yielded in the third year, the year of separating a tenth, and you've given it to the Levite, uh, given it to the Levites, the foreigner, the orphan, and the widow, so that they can have enough food to satisfy them while staying with you, you are to say in the presence of Adonai your God, I have rid my house of the things set aside for God and given them to the Levite, the foreigner, the orphan, and the widow, in keeping with every one of the commandments that you gave me. I have not disobeyed any of your commandments or forgotten them. I haven't eaten any of this food when mourning. I haven't put any of it aside when unclean, nor have I given any of it for the dead. I have listened to what Adonai my God has said. I have done everything you ordered me to do. Look out from your holy dwelling place from heaven. And bless your people Israel and the land you gave us as you swore to our ancestors, a land flowing with milk and honey. Today Adonai your God orders you to obey these laws and rulings. Therefore you are to observe and obey them with all your heart, with all your being. You are agreeing today that Adonai is your God, that you will follow his ways. You will observe his laws, his commandments, his rulings, and do what he says. In turn, Adonai is agreeing today that you are his own unique treasure as he promised you, that you are to observe all his commandments, and that he will raise you high above all the nations he has made in praise, reputation, and glory, and that, as he said, you will be a holy people for Adonai, your God. It's become common in the church to think that our total monetary obligation is to give a tithe of one-tenth of our income to the local congregation. And by doing so, that this fulfills any biblical duty we might have to give of our own possessions or prosperity. And even though the entire concept of tithing is introduced and explained and defined in the Older Testament, the so-called New Testament church has determined that, biblically speaking, we have no obligation to give anything beyond 10% of our income. Now, another alternative church, doc church doctrine is, is, is that if we feel some kind of a spiritual unction within us to give, then we only give according to the direction of that unction. Therefore, if we have no spirit-led unction to give, we have no duty to give anything at all. Now, I can tell you with full confidence that none of these three common doctrines concerning tithing and giving are scriptural. As we've seen in earlier books of the Torah, there were several kinds of giving and tithing that all operated simultaneously. In other words, you didn't select one or two types, your favorites, from a list of options. Each type was to occur at its prescribed time for its prescribed purpose. One type was to offer sacrifice of animals and grains to God at the altar for various reasons. And then there were the first fruit ceremonies that occurred multiple times during the year. In addition, there was support for the tabernacle or the temple workers and infrastructure. There was also the giving of money for vows. And in addition, there was to be support for the poor and the needy, for charity. And this is hardly an exhaustive list that I just gave you of the several kinds and purpose of giving obligations that were called for. Later, when the apostles were out teaching and preaching the gospel, 
Paul argued that it was the duty of the Messianic community to support these evangelists just as they supported the temple. But I want you to notice this was not that they were to stop supporting the temple in order then to redirect their support to the bearers of the good news. They were to not merely shift their giving from one designated purpose to another. It was to be in addition to all other forms of giving prescribed in the Torah. Giving to Paul and Peter and the others did not negate the various Torah requirements for giving. Naturally, once the temple was destroyed and the priesthood disbanded, certain types of giving became impossible. So our tithes and offerings and general giving isn't so straightforward, neat and clean, and relatively inexpen as inexpensive as has become the Western church model. Now what is described at the beginning in verse 12 has come to be known as the poor tithe. Every third year, a Hebrew individual's tithe was to be set aside in their local village as a means of support for the poor. Now this particular tithe was just one of several different kinds of giving and the purpose for this specific one, just this one, was to restock warehouses from which the poor and the needy and foreigners could draw. Therefore, instead of the usual manner in which first fruits were taken to the temple, and so the worshiper would feast on some of those first fruits, every third year, all those first fruits were donated as a poor tithe. Interestingly, however, the reality is that because Israel operated on the sabbatical year system, a system of seven year rolling cycles, the schedule for the poor tithe was actually three years, three years, four years. In other words, in a seven year cycle, year three was the first poor year tithe, a poor tithe year. Year six was the second poor tithe year, but since the seventh year was a year in which no crops were grown, no tithes of first fruits could be given whatsoever. Not to the temple, not to anybody, because there weren't any. So after giving the poor tithe in, the, in year six of the seven year cycle, another poor tithe would not be due until year three of the next seven year cycle. So four years have gone by. Now believe me, <laughs> the Israelites grew tired of obeying God in their financial matters, and so they modified to their favor the regulations of tithing and first fruits. The temple in particular did not like the loss of some of their income every third year, nor did they like not having control over giving to the poor. So about a century before Yeshua was born, the high priest John Hyrcanus, who by the way was an illegitimate high priest installed by the Hasman family, he declared the abolition of the poor tithe, as we read about it here in the Torah. The modern church has picked up on, on this, and many of the largest denominations require that all of its memberships, tithes, and offerings be given to their local church, and then the church's leadership will decide how it's to be doled out. When giving the poor tithe, the Hebrew farmer is to make a declaration to the Lord, more or less in the form of a vow. And the farmer states that he has indeed offered up that portion of his produce set aside for God. He's held nothing back. Now that may sound like a harmless nicety or just a formality. But the reality is that this is all about the inherently dangerous situation of dealing with God's holy property. That which is set aside for God is His, even before it is physically turned over to Him in some kind of a ceremony or a ritual. We see that principle developed very early in the Torah. 
at the moment that a worshiper even mentally selects a particular animal that he intends for his sacrifice, the ownership of that animal transfers to God at that moment. God's holy property is a sensitive matter to him, and those who try to misappropriate or misuse his holy property often suffer the death penalty. This has not ended. We recently looked at a story in the New Testament of Ananias and Sapphira, a believing husband and wife, followers of Yeshua, who inwardly determined to sell a piece of property they owned and to give the proceeds to the Messianic community. However, in secret, they held some of the proceeds back for themselves. And when, they, when the church leadership questioned whether they had given all the proceeds, they answered that they had a lie. And God instantly killed them. Again, New Testament folks, after Yeshua. So you see from this declaration that the farmer makes in Deuteronomy 26.13 that indeed he's held nothing back from the holy portion that's set aside for God. It is precisely the same form that was used in the book of Acts to question Ananias and Sapphira. To hold back that which has been promised to Jehovah God is to misappropriate his holy property. It is to rob God. Bad idea. The next portion of the declaration is that the worshiper has donated the first fruits as a poor tithe to fulfill all of God's commandments concerning the giving of first fruits, therefore properly discharging his obligations as prescribed by the law. Verse 14 begins a series of statements as part of this vow declaration to Jehovah in which the worshiper says he has handled this holy portion according, uh, accordingly while it's been in his home, his house. Now, there is more to handling God's holy property than simply giving it up when it's called for. It can be defiled. It can be made unclean by misuse in the interim. Part of the reason for this vow statement and some of the others is that because this tithe was taken to the local storehouse, it wasn't given to the priests. So therefore, there were fewer checks and balances. When given to the temple in normal years, priests inspected the produce to be sure of both quantity and quality. If the quality wasn't up to snuff or the quantity was suspect, the priest wouldn't accept it. The worshiper would be turned away. But here with the poor tithe, much could be done in secret. You can imagine how easy it would be for a giver to give less than the best of his produce when he knew it was going to the least valued people in their society and not to the temple, and likely nobody would be any the wiser. Now, the first of those statements he makes is that he has not defiled the poor tithe by eating a portion of it while he's in mourning. In other words, a mourner who has been in the same tent or house as a corpse, that mourner becomes unclean. And if a mourner, while he's in this unclean state, eats a portion of the offering that's been set aside for God, even if in good faith he replaced what he had eaten, maybe at a later time, then the entire holy portion was now defiled. It's no longer suitable for tithing. I want to take that a little bit further. The laws of what is prohibited and what is permissible is food. Pigs are prohibited, cows are permissible, is entirely separate from the laws of clean and unclean. 
Totally separate. Clean and unclean deals only with the condition of the permitted foods. It has nothing to do with the impermissible foods. Thus, any permissible food, like chicken or fish or most fruits, will then be in a clean or an unclean state according to how they're handled. Thus, an otherwise acceptable tithe of food can be made unclean by improper handling, and now it can't be used. Not because it's an impermissible food, but because this permissible food has now been made unclean. You following me? So this declaration by the worshiper that we're discussing indicates that apart from being unclean, tame, due to nearness to or contact with a corpse, the second statement is that the worshiper has not handled the holy food while he was unclean for any reason, thus, and thus transferring his uncleanness to the food. Now the next, next declaration by the giver is an odd sounding one. He declares he's not given any of the holy portion to the dead. Let that, let that one sink in for a second. Okay, I've not given any of my food to eat to dead people. Hmm, what does that mean? Now, I've shared with you on many occasions that the Hebrews maintained many superstitions about death and the afterlife that were common among the various peoples and cultures of the Middle East. I've also commented that, that, that the evidence of these superstitions about death and the afterlife are sprinkled all throughout the Old and New Testaments and are memorialized in archaic sayings and in practices that kind of fly right over modern heads when we read them in scripture passages. Someone once said to me, it seems as though in the Bible, in the Bible era, that God condoned and even allowed for these nearly universal customs of ancestor worship and life after death beliefs among his own set apart people. And that he seemed to be doing that at the same time he was giving Israel very specific laws and information against those practices. And I'd have to agree with that assessment. I think that's so. The matter of what happens to somebody after death is only briefly addressed in the New Testament, almost not at all in the Old there are vague biblical references to Sheol, the dead going to be with their fathers, the underground chambers of Abraham's bosom, paradise, Hades, and such. But the reason there are literally scores of varying doctrines within the church about hell and heaven or purgatory and resurrection and so on is because we're simply not given much information in the scriptures about death and what comes after. Now, I consider this one of those mysteries that God has, de uh, has determined he's going to hold for his own glory and will only share that which he deems a man needs to know. And apparently, what man needs to know was practically nothing in the days of the patriarchs, only slightly more in the days of the kings and prophets, and eventually a few more pieces of the puzzle were added in the New Testament era, but not much. Archaeologists have uncovered ancient Hebrew gravesites grave that had strange holes, small diameter tubes or passageways that went from ground level to where the body lay in repose. They were used to drop morsels of food and beverage down to the corpse. Ancestor worship was practiced differently among different cultures. Indeed, some didn't literally worship their dead ancestors or, or pray to them. Others didn't offer worship, but simply decided that some essence of that dead person lived on. And so, my gosh, they certainly have to eat. Or that they had ongoing needs 
these dead people, like perfume. Phew, I'd say so. And incense. And most of all, the dead craved communication with the living. So it was critical that a person had children because then the children would attend to their afterlife needs. During almost all the biblical era, a significant section of the Hebrew society practiced this custom in one way or another. Now with that bit of information, perhaps now you can see why. The worshiper in Deuteronomy 26.14 swears, I've not given any portion of the set apart for tithing food to the dead. It's not that the normal practice of giving food to the dead was necessarily being prohibited by God. It's that any kind of contact with a grave site automatically defiles the worshiper. So, if the food do dropped down that hole to that body came from God's holy portion, then the powerful uncleanliness that comes from death would render whatever, worship, whatever that worshiper had set aside as his tithe is now unworthy to be given to the Lord. That's the thought process we're being given here. So in verse 15 now, the focus of the argument shifts from the individual to the nation as a whole. Now I've mentioned on numerous occasions that while in biblical Hebrewism, the focus is more on the community of Israel as a whole, and the role of the individual is primarily is but a member of that community. In Christianity, the tendency is to focus almost entirely on the individual, and the behavior of the community of God tends to play the lesser role. In this mystical four-chapter segment of Deuteronomy that we're in, we're going to see more attention paid to the individual worshiper than anywhere else in the Torah. Not surprisingly, at the end of this series of declarations by an pardon me, for the individual worshiper who's giving his offering, verse 15 gets back to the more typical Torah format of placing the whole congregation as above that of the individual. So the worshiper finishes by asking God to bless who? All Israel. As a result of each individual displaying proper obedience to God's commandments. Well, next, Moses states that the key to pleasing God is to faithfully adhere to his rules and regulations. How? With all your heart and soul. This, of course, reminds us of the great commandment that supports all other commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, with all your strength. Remember, Heart in the biblical era means mind. The idea is that every aspect of our being is to submit to the direction and will of the Lord at all times. All of us. This certainly punctures the modern Western notion of separation of church and state or the compartmentalization of our human activities into the religious and the secular that's now seen as the politically correct way to go about things. A person seeking elected office today has a litmus test that he or she must be willing to separate their faith from their public duties and the decisions they make. Even mentioning God is a cause for suspicion. If not, downright disqualification. But even the average synagogue or churchgoer today finds that life is a lot easier if we only live out our faith during Shabbat, or from maybe 9 to noon on Sunday. But then we put that faith back on the shelf at all other times. Well, verses 17, 18, and 19 are very powerful in my estimation. First, they fully demonstrate 
the mutual nature of covenant relationship that has been established between Israel and God by means of the Mosaic Covenant. Now second, these verses finalize the acceptance of the terms of the covenant by both God and Israel. And third, a summary of what precisely each side's agreed to is presented. And the Lord says that Israel has already agreed to the covenant, individual by individual. And that means that Israel will walk in his ways, observe his laws and commandments, and obey God. And the key to understanding this is that Israel has agreed to more than an intellectual assent to God's rules. They've agreed to hold it in their hearts in a way that brings about action. And in return for intel, uh, in, uh, Israel's intellectual assent and action to demonstrate their faithfulness, Jehovah God promises that as of this moment, His treasured people are above every other people and nation on earth. And further, that in God's eyes, Israel's holy, not because they are inherently better than anybody else, but because they have submitted to his covenant offer, he is now free to declare them holy, which is what he's just done. Further, God has given Israel preeminence above all other nations on earth. It's not that the rest of humanity doesn't matter to God. Of course it does. Rather, it is that he's given Israel priority status. It's just like the pattern demonstrated among the tribes of Israel. All Israel is holy, but the Levites have been set apart and made a step above and a step holier than common Israel. Further, from the tribe of the Levites, the clan of the priests has been set apart and made a bit more holy than the Levites. And from among the clan of the Levitical priests, the family of the high priest has been set apart and made the most holy of all Israelites. So we have varying degrees of holiness and authority established, but it is all done according to God's declaration, not the merit of humans that membership to each level is established. Now, I have such a bittersweet feeling about this declaration of Jehovah. I know that he keeps his promises, promises and, that, and, and though thousands of years pass, the return of the Jewish people to their homeland only proves he never changes and he never forgets. But I also have such trepidation heart sickness over my brothers and sisters in the faith who are worse than blind to this never-ending promise of God that Israel is and shall remain his precious treasure. Too many steadfastly insist that God has abandoned his treasure, Israel, in favor of the church, naturally meaning a Gentile church. Folks, if God, and I want you to hear this, just think it through rationally. If God can do that, or would do that, why would we think that he wouldn't at some point in another newer revelation abandon the church for some other group with some other understanding of who belongs and who doesn't? Why wouldn't he? If we can say, well, he did it to the Israelites. I mean, what you say, but Jesus promises he'll never abandon us. Well, that's what that's the same promise the Father made to Israel. And he recorded it in numerous places throughout the Old Testament. So if we can find an excuse for the Father to permanently abandon Israel, well, then we can certainly contemplate a situation whereby Jesus can permanently abandon his followers. The really good news is Neither has the Father given up on Israel, nor will Yeshua give up on us. Let's get that message out to the Jewish people of this earth and to the church. Now, I want to end this chapter with this comment. The entire 
tone and context of what we have just concluded makes it clear that what God is seeking is a personal relationship with humans. Obedience to the precepts and principles of His commandments is His prescribed means of demonstrating our love for Him. That's how we do it. But at the same time, keeping those commandments is not the means to our own justification or the establishment of our own righteousness any more than it was for the Hebrews. Only when one follows God in a heartfelt way, only when one makes our relationship with Him the focus of our lives in love and submission, only when one is redeemed by the only Redeemer, will there, the only one that will ever be, by the way, does doing all those commandments have any value at all? I want to remind you that before the law, before the Torah was given on Mount Sinai, Israel was redeemed. Redeemed first. God didn't say to Israel, I'll tell you what, I'll give you the law and we'll see how you do. And if you meet my standard, then I'll redeem you. That's not how it went. The pattern is redemption first, obedience to the commandments next. It was that way in the Old Testament. It remains that way in the New. It remains that way for us. Let's move on to chapter 27. Deuteronomy chapter 27. Page 226, if you have a complete Jewish Bible. Then Moses and all the leaders of Israel gave orders to the people, and they said, Observe all the commandments I've given you today. When you cross the Jordan to the land, Adonai your God has given you, given you, you are to uh, set up large stones, put plaster on them. And after crossing over, write this Torah on them, every word, so that you can enter the land Adonai your God is giving you, a land flowing with milk and honey, as Adonai the God of your ancestors promised to you. When you have crossed the Jordan, you are to set up these stones as I'm ordering you today on Mount Ebal and put plaster on them. You are There you are to erect an altar to Adonai your God, an altar made of stones. You're not to use any iron tool on them, but are to build the altar of, God, of Adonai your God of uncut stones. You are to offer burnt offerings on it to Adonai your God. Also, you are to sacrifice peace offerings. Eat there. Be joyful in the presence of Adonai your God. You are to write on the stones all the words of this Torah very clearly. Next, Moses and the priests, who are Levites, spoke to all Israel. And they said, Be quiet and listen, Israel. Today you have become the people of Adonai, your God. Therefore you are to listen to what Adonai, your God, says, and obey his mitzvot, his commandments and laws, which I am giving you today. That same day, Moses commissioned the people as follows. These are the ones who are to stand, stand on Mount Gerizim and bless the people after you have crossed the Jordan. Shimon, Levi, Yehuda, Yisachar, Yosef, and Benjamin. While, th while these are to stand on Mount Eval for the curse. Reoven, God, Asher, Zebulun, Dan, and Naphtali. The Levites speaking loudly, loudly will proclaim to every man of Israel, a curse on anyone who makes a carved or a metal image, something Adonai detests, the handiwork of a craftsman, and he sets it up in secret. All the people are to respond by saying, Amen. A curse on anyone who dishonors his father or mother, all the people are to say, Amen. A curse on anyone who moves his neighbor's boundary marker, all the people are to say, Amen. A curse on anyone who causes a blind person to lose his way on the road. All the people are to say, Amen. A curse on anyone who interferes with justice for the foreigner, for the orphan, or for the widow. All the people are to say, Amen. A curse on anyone who has sexual relations with his father's wife because he's violated his father's rights. All the people are to say, Amen. Amen. 
A curse on anyone who has sexual relations with any kind of an animal. All the people are to say, Amen. A curse on anyone who has sexual relations with his sister, no matter whether she is the daughter of his father or of his mother. All the people are to say, Amen. A curse on anyone who has sexual relations with his mother-in-law. All the people are to say, Amen. A curse on anyone who secretly attacks a feather, fellow member of the community. All the people are to say, Amen. A curse on anyone who accepts a bribe to kill an innocent person. All the people are to say, Amen. A curse on anyone who does not conform, who does not confirm the words of this Torah by putting them into practice. And all the people are to say, Amen. This is one of those places in the Bible that is a major bother to Torah scholars. It is a various, very, very curious chapter that some say must be out of place. Some claim that in the process of handing down the Bible and the various redactions that happened over the centuries, somewhere along the line, something got out of order. I suppose that's possible. But also understand that even if this chapter is out of order, in other words, it's placed incorrectly in the order of the book, everything it says is still true. The principles it outlines don't change, so there's no cause to be concerned. And by the way, it's by no means universally agreed upon that there's a perceived problem of the chapter order in this book that exists. The major problem, you see, is in the literary form of this chapter. Notice that since the beginning of Deuteronomy, we have Moses speaking a sermon, primarily using the present tense. The narrative also uses a lot of I and we. Then it suddenly changes and speaks in the third person. Him, they, her. That is, it's not Moses speaking. It's someone else speaking about what Moses said and did. It's speaking in the past tense. Later, it speaks of multiple covenant renewal ceremonies that are each occurring in different places. But the wording makes it appear that they all happen simultaneously. Now, I have no intention of delving deeply into the relatively new academic discipline called literary criticism, even though it is from that academic discipline that these skepticisms arise. That is, the literary critics say that the grammar and the form isn't what they expect. Therefore, the content is suspect. Now, instead, I see a little problem with the content other than a couple, I see no problem, rather, with the content other than a couple of very minor, minor issues that has very little bearing on it except as a curiosity. And I'll point those out when we get there. Now, chapter 27 documents ceremonies that mark the arrival of Israel into the Promised Land, Canaan. Pretty big deal. And the ceremonies are specifically to take place on Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. There the curses and the blessings of the covenant of Moses will be pronounced. Now in verse 1, an anomaly is uncovered. Here is the only place in the Torah where the elders join Moses in commanding the people. Now, some scholars think this is also some kind of late redaction, but to me it's natural. It makes all the sense in the world. Moses is about to die. He knows this. He's not going to enter the Promised Land. He's already been told that by the Lord. When one is about to turn over authority to someone else, it has always been typical to publicly display the legitimacy of this transition by including the incoming authority figure at appropriate times when the current leader is making speeches and declarations. Moses is simply showing the elders the ropes. And he's demonstrating to the people what it's going to look like when he's not around anymore. He wants no suspicion of foul play, no cause for rebellion and doubt. The new leader will not be from Moses' family. 
which was the expected line of succession in those days. Rather, leadership is going to fall to Joshua, the priests, and the elders to rule over Israel. In just a matter of days from the time of this sermon, Moses will be no more. Here's where we encounter another difficulty. Verse 2 says that as soon as Israel crosses over the Jordan River into Canaan, they are to erect large stones as memorial markers. The problem is that it says they're to erect them at Mount Ebal, even though they crossed over the Jordan near Jericho. And let me tell you, Mount Ebal is a solid 30 miles north of Jericho, and that's as the crow flies. But due to the ruggedness of the area, it's probably at least a five-day journey, maybe more, between those two points. So where it says, on the day you have crossed the Jordan, they are to set up the stones on a ball, that's impossible to accomplish. In light of what we read elsewhere about this historic event, however, likely we ought to take the phrase to mean not on the day, but once you've crossed over the Jordan. Once you've done it. In other words, it was just a common way of speaking that means to do it expediently. It doesn't mean to do it before the sun sets that day. The Israelites are to coat these large flat stones with wet plaster. And then, to, then inscribe into that wet plaster the words of the Torah. Now, I want to recall that while we tend to use the word Torah as the formal title, for the first five books of the Bible. In fact, that word's also just a generic term that means teaching or instruction. The commandment then is not to write the entire contents of the five books of Moses onto those plastered stones. Good luck. Rather, it is to write the high points of Moses' sermon about the law in Deuteronomy on those tablets. Generally, Probably, it's the list of blessings and curses. Now, writing on plastered rocks was not something employed by all, cult all cultures, certainly not by nomads. But writing on plaster was a usual and customary way of memorializing important edicts and events, guess where? In Egypt, where they'd come from. This procedure would have been totally familiar to the Israelites. Besides, the large amount of writing that was being called for could be best accomplished in a fraction of the time by scribing characters into wet plaster with a silus as opposed to chiseling out letters on hard stone. In addition to setting up these enormous stones embossed with the words of Moses on them at Mount Ebal, they were also to build an altar for sacrificing. The stones were to be carefully piled up to create a usable altar, but they were not to be formed and chiseled into perfect shapes using iron tools. The building material for the altar was to be of natural stones, just as they're found lying about on the ground. Now, Mount Ebal and its twin mountain, Gerizim, were located in the old stomping grounds of the patriarch Abraham. No doubt that had something to do with why they were chosen for the historic covenant renewal ceremony. Mount Ebal is about three miles north of Mount Gerizim, and the city in the plain of Shechem, today it's called Nablus, is in between the two. Mount Ebal rose to a height of about 1,200 feet about the city of Shechem, so whatever would take place up there could be seen for miles in every direction. And by the way, those that just got off the tour from Israel this last time went up to Mount Ebal. And you could see Gerizim. This is all, by the way, in Palestinian territory. So it was kind of fun going up there. Now, verse 8 gives the instruction that the teachings... Of, the, of Yehovah through Moses that were to be inscribed into the plaster were to be written by Er Hetev, literally setting it out well. In other words, it was to be prominent and it was to be easy to read. 
The rabbis have done some excellent work on this subject, and they point out that the intent of this instruction is that the common man could read and understand the meaning. And since these were the words of God, and since Israel had a priesthood, it would have been rather expected in the religious mindset of that era that the words would be of a mystical form that only God's direct servant, his priests, could render correctly. This was the norm for most Middle Eastern cultures. That the priests were the only ones entitled to the divine words and the only ones who could even comprehend them. The goal, of course, was to control the people. I mean, after all, if only the priests possessed the divine word, and even where it was publicly written, only the priests could decipher it, then whatever the priest said was truth. Who was going to dispute it? These plastered stones, plainly written upon, were monuments to demonstrate that the word of God was to be possessed by all of Israel, not just a privileged class. Well, we've all studied, to one level or another, the European Inquisition in school. And the heart of the matter is that the early Inquisition was that certain people outside of the institutional church authority began to acquire copies of Scripture. Lay people wanted to read the Word of God for themselves. In some cases, it was because they no longer trusted the church authority. Those people were considered criminals, as only the church authority was allowed to have Scripture, because they were considered as the only ones with the divine knowledge and authorization to interpret Scripture. If the people at large actually possessed Holy Scripture, then church control over the people would be a lot more difficult. Thousands and thousands of believers were burned to death by the church, burned at the stake for possessing a fragment of a page of the Bible. While in time those laws against owning scripture were abandoned, another transition began in more modern times whereby even though Bibles are cheap and plentiful, people lost interest in scripture and have been encouraged to accept the denomination's articles of faith or doctrinal pillars instead of spending the time to study God's word on your own. In that vein, I would like to close today with a quote from D.L. Christensen, a, a, a highly acclaimed Christian Bible scholar. He says this, One of the curious features of modern worship within the evangelical churches today is the absence of public recitation of the scriptures as an end in itself. Much time is given to singing songs of praise, many of which are simply biblical texts put to music, but very little time is given to hearing the Bible read, other than perhaps the typically very limited text on which a pastor's sermon will be based. We need to find ways to expose our people to the whole of the Bible in public worship in the manner that ancient Israel experienced Deuteronomy on Mount Ebal. Next time, we'll take up that pivotal ceremony on the breezy summit of Mount Ebal above the ancient city of Shechem. Please rise.